Have you ever wondered how de Broglie derived his famous formulas for a mass particle? Namely, that its energy equals Planck's constant times its frequency, and that its momentum equals Planck's constant divided by its wavelength. In this video, we will replicate his arguments in as visual way as possible. De Broglie's starting point was the following brave idea. Quantum mechanics had shown that a wave, namely light, can be a particle, namely a photon. Therefore, he ventured to ask, can a mass particle also be a wave? This idea is visualized by the simulation, where we see both a particle and a vibration around it. What a wonderfully radical idea. So radical, in fact, that his thesis almost got rejected. Let us see if we can make such claims more precise. First natural question is, if, and that's a big if at that, if the particle was a wave, what might be its frequency? Well, first, let's go back to quantum mechanics and remind ourselves about the photon. Planck's famous formula tells us that the frequency of a light particle is proportional to its energy. Okay, so maybe energy also determines the frequency of our mass particle. What is the energy of a mass particle? For this, we cite yet another famous formula from Einstein's theory of relativity, which says that the energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared. All right, so let's put these together to obtain the key formula, which tells us that the frequency of a particle is proportional to its mass. The proportionality constants include Planck's constant from quantum mechanics and the speed of light from the theory of relativity. We can observe this in the simulation. As the particle's size and mass increases, the vibrational frequency increases too. And conversely. Excellent, but what if the particle gets moving? Here we encounter a problem, for what happens to a clock that is moving? It slows down, right? You know it because of relativistic time dilation. Okay, so the inner frequency of a particle then must decrease. In the simulation, notice how the vibration of the moving packet is visibly slower. But here's the problem. For if the particle is moving, it additionally has kinetic energy. So it has more energy than a stationary particle. The exact relativistic increase of energy is by a factor of gamma, as shown on the screen. But energy and frequency were supposed to be directly proportional. So it would follow that the frequency ought to increase. A contradiction. Our beautiful mass frequency relation seems to break down immediately as we set the particle moving. By the way, in the simulation it seems we, the observer, are moving. But it is the relative motion that counts, since motion is always relative. So, we have found ourselves a paradox. What is the solution? Is there a solution? But of course there is. And the solution arises from the same source which created the paradox itself. The theory of special relativity. For our picture is wrong, and we have forgotten about a crucial effect in relativity. Breaking down 
or more like shifting, of simultaneity. Let us simplify the setting to get a clear understanding of the consequences. These pointers represent clocks. In this frame, they are synchronized. However, when we accelerate, Einstein says that the clocks in front of us skip ahead in time. The further ahead they are in space, the more ahead they skip in time. In this moving frame then, the clocks are no longer in sync and in fact seem to create waves with their phases. This is purely a relativistic phenomenon. Next, as a middle step, let us set the ground plane in oscillation too. You can imagine this as zooming very close to the localized particle so that we can't even see where its wave packet starts to fall off. Again, as we move relative to the ground, both the clocks and the ground go out of sync, thereby creating phase waves in the moving frame. Note that the phase waves go faster if we slow down. Their speed is inversely proportional to our velocity. In fact, they always go faster than the speed of light. They do not carry information though, so no law of relativity is broken. Going back to the localized particle, we now understand that there will be a very important additional effect in the picture. The moving wave packet acquires ripples. It is these ripples that will salvage our broken mass frequency relationship. And it's the wavelength of these ripples which will be associated with the momentum of the particles. Let us first and foremost solve the frequency paradox, for otherwise the whole concept is doomed. Now, it is true that the inner clock of the moving particle runs slow. We, the observer, however, will measure the frequency as the number of ups and downs that reach us during a time interval. In the simulation, the white orb will serve as a frequency indicator of these ups and downs. Time dilation does reduce the intrinsic ups and downs, but, and this is the key point, the ripples create some extra spatial ups and downs, which counteract the effect of time dilation. In fact, the ripples more than compensate for the time dilation, and the end result is that we measure more ups and downs during a time interval. We have provided the principle of the counteracting mechanism, but not a detailed calculation. It is not difficult to show that the end result is exactly an increase by one gamma factor. Just what we need if we want both sides of the equation to match. but we will skip that proof and do something even better. We show that the wavelength of the ripples is related to the momentum of the particle. For simplicity, let us again zoom in, so to speak, on the stationary particle. Now, let us describe this situation with the two-dimensional space-time diagram. The horizontal lines represent the wave crests of a spatially uniform oscillation. The yellow coordinate axes represent the frame of a moving observer, or a frame where the particle is seen as moving. Let us transform into that moving frame. By the properties of Lorentz transform, the horizontal lines tilt. In this frame, then, we see those face waves. What we are interested in is the period and wavelength of this face wave. Let us do some basic geometry. Delta x prime is the distance between two waves. Delta t prime is the time between two waves. And this line is the distance traveled by a phase wave during one interval. Using similarity of the triangles, we get this relation.
First, the times cancel out. Then, let us just remind ourselves that the delta x is the wavelength. And delta time is the period. And the left hand side is the velocity of the wave. In technical terms, phase velocity. So we have an interesting equation which says that the phase velocity is inverse of the velocity of the particle. Now, the crux of the argument. First, we realize that the velocity of the particle is the velocity of the wave packet. Secondly, we recall that the velocity of a wave packet is called group velocity. And it's obtained from the so-called dispersion relation, like this. In words, the group velocity is the differential of angular frequency with respect to the wave number k. We do not prove this subtle but well-known fact. The angular frequency omega, by the way, is just a scaled version of the frequency. And the wave number k is basically the inverse of the wavelength. Let us express the phase velocity with the angular parameters too. Now, we have a differential equation. Let's solve it. Separation of variables. Integration from initial values to final values. Rearranging a bit. And we arrive at this. Assuming the initial state is at rest means the initial wave number k is zero. Take a good look at this. It might look familiar. Remember that angular frequency is basically the energy and wave number is basically the momentum. So we can make the following connections. Final frequency is the total energy. Final wave number is the momentum. And initial frequency is the energy of the stationary particle, which is just the mass. By the way, here we are working in units where the reduced Planck's constant and speed of light are set to 1. We see that we recover the energy-momentum relation from special relativity. So what we have shown is that if we start with a vibrating wave packet at rest, then, as the wave packet is set moving, two things will happen. One, the packet will automatically acquire a phase wave. And two, frequency and the wave number of the moving packet is related to the frequency of the stationary wave with the same formula as energy and momentum is related to mass in special relativity. This then suggests that we actually can, in fact, make de Broglie's famous interpretation. 1. The frequency is energy. 2. Wave number is momentum. And 3. Stationary frequency is mass. Note that, in a sense, we barely need to postulate the de Broglie formulas for the energy and momentum. They could easily be discovered by just studying a vibrating wave packet within the framework of special relativity. Irving Schrodinger was inspired by this new wave nature of particles, and using de Broglie's ideas, went on to develop his famous Schrodinger equation, which is a wave equation for non-relativistic particles. To reach his wave equation, Schrodinger introduced complex numbers. If we wanted to incorporate the complex aspect into our picture, we might do it like this. The colors of the rope represent different complex phases. Later, Max Born gave the modern interpretation of the wave as a probability distribution. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned something new. See you next time.